Good morning. I recognize what we're going to talk about this morning is a little bit different than what you guys usually think about as you're doing your daily jobs and things like that. But, you know, Nizzy and uh, Shireen both mentioned a, little, a minute ago that everybody lies, right? I mean, you all have probably been lied to in the past, maybe even told a lie or two in the past. Do I have anybody in the room who's going to tell me they never lie? No one? Okay, that's good. At least I don't see anyone with the lights on. Uh, would it surprise you if I told you, actually, let's do a little experiment first. I want you to find someone in the room, and I want you to point at them. I know it's rude, but I want you to point at them. And as you're pointing, I'm going to point at you. Who are you? Aaron. I'm going to point at Aaron. So find someone in the room, point at them, and then look around to see who is staring at you, who's pointing at you. Okay? So then I want you to hold your hand up, and with this being five and this being zero, I want you to, t and I'd like everybody to do this for just a moment. With this being, this being zero, this being five, tell me how many times you think that person has lied in the last 24 hours. <laughs> okay, now look around the room and just, just look around the room and see what people are doing and saying. Okay, look around the room. Okay, you can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. Let me start by saying you guys are a really, really polite group. Because I saw a lot of these. I saw a couple of these, a few of these. I didn't have any flashers, though. Normally, I do this training. I got people with both hands flashing. They take their shoes off if they could. I talk about how many times they think people had lied. All right? Would it surprise you if I told you that a person lies an average of 10 times a day? Okay? Now, I know some of you are sitting in there going, no, no, that's not true. I don't lie 10 times a day. But think about it for just a moment. When I talk about lying 10 times a day, I'm talking about things like somebody asking you how you're doing, and you have a splitting headache, and you say, fine, because you don't want to get into it. All right? So when I talk about lies, I'm talking about a complete range from those little white lies that we tell either not to hurt someone's feelings or to keep a conversation from going in a direction we don't want it to go in to those really big, bold-faced lies where I didn't do it. Okay? Why is this important to you guys? Why is knowing what a lie looks like to you is important to you? Whether you're hiring employees, you know, whether you've got a screening process going, whether you have an investigation because someone's been stealing from your company and you need to put yourself in an investigative mindset. You know, any of those things that you touch as, as, as executives in retail or folks that are involved in retail, it's important. If you're a buyer and you're going out looking to see if you're getting the best deal on the things that you're looking to buy, do you want to know if that person's telling you the truth? Or do you want to know if you have a little bit more wiggle room? So the purpose of teaching you about lying today, and I'm not going to tell you everything about it because we don't have all day, but I'm going to touch on the things that are most important to you, and I hope that you'll find that they do have something to do with what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? If I forget to say this, and I usually do, I'm going to say it before I leave. When you finish this 45 minutes with me, you're going to be dangerous. You're going to know just enough to be dangerous. All right? So don't take this home and use it on your significant others. It's not going to lead you where you want to go. Children, however, use it all the time on kids. All right? I have a 16-year-old son. If his lips are moving, he's lying. All right? So just setting you up with that. So let's get into this. Just a little bit about me. I think they've told you. Uh, it's all over the place, actually. I am former CIA. I still do a lot of work with them. But the point is, is it's in the CIA that I learned what it looks like when people are lying. Um, I, I have a, a, a master's in forensic psychology and education. I spent over 20 years with the agency. I uh, developed a screening program with inside the agency. And we actually take this program, this, this Spy the Lie program, all over the world and teach people about lying all over the world. So people say to me, well, Susan, if you're teaching everybody what lying looks like, can't they use that against you? Right? If I learn to lie, if Erin learns to lie and I'm interviewing her for a job and she's lying, will I see it if she knows how to beat me? The good thing is there's so many different things about lying that you can't hide them all. So Erin may be able to lie to me with a couple of sentences, but sooner or later I'm going to figure out she's lying and then I'm going to go try to find out what the truth is. Okay, so enough about me. Let's get into this. The way I want to start this is I want to show you a brief video. 
all right? And I want you to tell me whether Jamie, this young lady right here at the end of this video, is lying to me or not, all right? So all of you came into the room today with some gut that tells you whether someone's being truthful or not, right? We all think we know what deception looks like. We all think we know what truth looks like. So with that gut that you guys have that tells you whether somebody's truthful or not, I want you to judge Jamie. We ready to go? Okay. Question for you, Jamie, is what involvement did you have in the company's recently discovered fraudulent accounting activities? Oh, none at all. Did you ever direct Mr. Glenn to backdate any contracts? No, of course not. <laughs> Prior to the recent audit that uncovered these accounting irregularities, did you have any knowledge that Mr. Glenn was backdating contracts? No. I mean, if I, if I had knowledge about that, then I would speak up and say something. Is there any reason that a forensic computer review would uncover any communication with Mr. Glenn regarding this matter? No, of course not. I don't have any communication with him regarding this at all. At any time, did Mr. Glenn ever reveal or discuss his efforts to manipulate the company's accountings with you? No. If he had, then I would have told someone fired him, gotten something, something would have happened if I knew anything. Jamie, why should we believe that you're not involved in this matter? I've always had a very good reputation with the company. Um, I have no uh, enemies in the company, no one, you know, I, I've always done my best and I believe that I have a very good reputation with that and people trust me and um, I, I would never do something like that, especially for something that I've worked so hard at. What do you think should happen to the senior manager who directed Mr. Glenn to backdate these contracts? Uh, he should be fired and go to jail and there should be serious consequences. Would you be willing to certify in writing that you had nothing to do with these accounting irregularities? Yes, of course. I'll sign it right now. Okay, so this was a situation where there's an investigation going on in a company because um, the accountant had been cooking the books. And when we went in to do the investigation, we asked him why he was cooking the books. They were getting ready to go into a, a, a sell the company. They were looking to raise the, the, the value of the company. But he said he did it specifically because he was told to. We asked him who told him, and he didn't want to tell us. So we investigated. We interviewed a whole bunch of people, Jamie being one of them. Now, I heard a couple of people say she was lying right off the top, right? And maybe she was and maybe she wasn't. But as that interview went on, were there times when you caught yourself going, no, I think she's being truthful? And other times when you said that, that's a lie, right? How do we know whether she's being truthful or not? What are we looking for in there? Let me ask you this question. Even if Jamie was being truthful, did she have a reason to be nervous? Absolutely, right? So how do we know whether her nervousness or whether her behavior is a result of nervousness or whether it's a result of not being truthful? How do we know that? That's what we want to learn, right? If you have somebody sitting in front of you for a job interview, or you're, in, you're talking to someone in a company, all your employees in a company because there's been a major theft, or there's even been a little theft, do those folks have a reason to be nervous? Absolutely. They want to make sure you're getting it right. They want to make sure they're coming across in the way they, they, they should come across. So how do we know the difference? Let's take a look at a few things. There are six keys to knowing whether someone's being truthful or not, or whether someone's being deceptive. We're gonna look at all of these individually. We've got analyze versus speculate, okay? What do I mean by that? Can I look at anybody in this room and say, they're, they're lying to me just by looking at them, just by the way they're sitting, all right? Manage your bias. Every single one of us in this room has a bias. We may know what that bias is, but we may not know, 
All right? It just happens. We, it comes across. People recognize it, but we don't see it. We want to recognize evasiveness. What does that look like when someone's trying to evade telling me the truth or evade telling me a deception? We want to be aware of aggression. Aggression is one of the major keys for people being deceptive. We're all gonna, also going to look at convey versus convince. What do I mean by convey versus convincing? And finally, we're going to look at some of those nonverbal cues. Any of you folks who used to watch um, Lie to Me? That's what you saw with the nonverbals. <laughs> That's what you saw with the nonverbals. So we're going to look at some of those. All right, so let's get started. When I talk about analyze versus, analyzing versus speculation, what I want to look at is how a person is reacting to things. OK? So I need, I need to find somebody who's sitting like I want them to. Um, actually, you see the gentleman in the back right there who's got his arms resting? OK, if he, if he were crossing his arms right here like this, OK, how do we view this behavior? How have we always been told this behavior is? Closed, standoffish, and stuff like that, right? And a lot of people assume that closed behavior means that they're trying to, trying to, to manipulate me, all right? They're trying to come across as being truthful, all right? I'm just going to hold myself right here so that nobody knows that I'm lying. Well, you know what? Maybe he's standing that way because he's cold. Maybe he's standing that way because it's comfortable for him, all right? That just may be a habit for him. I don't want to turn around and say, look, close posture equals deception. Because if I do that, I'm getting myself in trouble. So a lot of us look at global behavior. All right, We look at whether they shift all the time. We look at whether, whether they um, you know, do some of the stuff that Jamie did when she scratched her nose, all those sort of things. We give way too much weight to global behavior. We want to do away with that. That is speculation. I don't want to speculate why, why that gentleman in the back is sitting there with his arms crossed like that. All right. What, what I want to do, in other words, is I want to identify that the behaviors that I see and hear are a direct result of my question. So if I ask Aaron, Aaron, did you, did you take the missing merchandise, all right, and, and, and she's sitting like that, that's, that's bad. That would, if I look at that as a global valuation, that's bad. I don't want to give her that. All right, I want, it to, I want to see the behaviors and hear the behaviors as a result of the question I ask. And I'll make sense in a minute. I want to identify the stimulus. The stimulus in this case, whether it's an investigation, whether it's a screening interview, whether you're talking to someone that you want to employ in your organization, the stimulus is going to be the question that I ask. All right, during any interview, during any communication, people are going to move. I want that movement to come when I ask the question, okay? Not when they're just sitting here having a conversation. And that'll make, again, more sense in a minute. I want to focus on the behaviors that are directly, as I said, re re associated with the response. Do you say and do something as a response of my question, okay? One of those deceptive behaviors. And I'm going to rely on what we call timing and clusters. And this is really the big deal, the timing and clusters thing. So for example, when I ask a question, I want that person to show me a deceptive behavior within the first five seconds after I ask that question. If they don't show me a deceptive behavior of the list that I'm going to show you in a minute, and within five seconds, they're not lying to me. They're not lying to me. Okay? I need to see or hear one of those behaviors in the first five seconds. If I see the first behavior in the first five seconds, I don't have to see another behavior for two or three or five or ten seconds. All right? But I do have to see that first one in the first five seconds. Now, I'm not trying to be catty here, but I've seen CEOs that can lie for 15 minutes on one question. Okay? And there's a behavior I'm going to show you that allows you to see that, how that happens. But what I want to make sure is that the first behavior happens in the first five seconds. So this is what it looks like. You're all bright people. You know what five seconds is. Okay? <laughs> my other, my other, other thing I want to pay attention to are clusters. And this is what makes a difference in our deceptive um, behaviors versus other people's deceptive um, categories and techniques. I want to see more than one deceptive behavior within that first five seconds, or within that answer. So, I've got V's, which are verbals, N's that are nonverbals. I want to see at least 
two or more behaviors for that to be a deceptive answer. Does that make sense? So if I see one, I might not like it, I'm going to pay attention to it, but I really want two or more. So if I'm saying that my first behavior has to be within the first five seconds, right, and I need two or more deceptive indicators, do I have a deceptive answer here? I do, right? Now you notice that I've got one that, that happens before I actually finish the question, that question stimulus, I'm asking a question and I get a nonverbal deceptive behavior, I'm going to count that even though it's not within my first five seconds. Why do you think I, someone might give me a nonverbal or a verbal deceptive behavior before I finish the question? Exactly, they're starting to frame their answer, and guess what? They think faster than I talk, all right? They say that the average person talks 120 to 150 words a minute. The brain goes much faster than that. Okay, some, some behavioralists say it goes at least 10 times faster. Some behavioralists say you can't measure because we don't think in words, we think in concepts. All right, so if somebody gives me a verbal response or a nonverbal response before I finish my question, it's simply because their brain is going faster than my mouth is. All right, and then I've got that outlier there, that nonverbal that lies outside of that first five seconds. Am I going to count that? What? I am, right, Aaron? I'm going to count. Why am I going to count it? Exactly, because I had one that happened within the first five seconds, right? So any behaviors that I keep seeing that fall outside that first five seconds before I ask another question is going to be part of my cluster. So if I've got one, two, I've got seven here, right? That tells me I've got a liar. That tells me I've got a person who's not being candid. And to, by the way, we never call them a liar. We just say they're not being candid, OK? So I've got, I've got somebody who's not being candid with me. What if I had just two inside that first five seconds? Would that be a truthful answer? Would that be a deceptive answer? It would be deceptive, right? Now, is that lie right there a bigger lie than the person who only shows me two deceptive behaviors? We have no way of knowing, right? We have no way of knowing that, that two deceptive behaviors could be my son telling me he doesn't have homework. I'm sorry, that one could be my son telling me he doesn't have homework, all right? The person who shows me two deceptive indicators might be a really, really bad person, but it comes down to how much someone's buying into the lie. How important is it for me to convince you I'm being truthful? And at the end of the day, when people are doing this kind of stuff, what they're trying to do is manipulate us. Okay? Manipulate us to believe them. All right? Manipulation is a big thing, but that's what they're doing. They're doing and saying things to manipulate our thoughts about them. Okay. So, timing and clusters. That's our most important thing, timing and clusters. We want to manage our bias. All right? Now, it says up here that I want to ignore truthful behavior. Why do you think I want to ignore truthful behavior? Any thoughts? Good, okay, right? We're inherently good. Is everybody inherently good? I mean, she's right. She's absolutely right. You know, look, we were all raised to be good people. Well, at least 90% of us in the room were raised to be good people. Can't speak for everybody, right? But we were taught lying was wrong, right? Didn't your parents tell you lying was not a good thing to do? All right, did your parents ever say to you, look, if you lie, you're going to be in twice as the trouble that you would have been if you had just told me the truth and done something wrong, right? So we know lying is wrong. At least that's, that's what we're, we've been taught, that lying is wrong. Deceptive people can give us truthful answers. So if you ask a question of a person that they're comfortable answering, they can answer that truthfully, okay? Any discussion that you have, any interview, any, any, again, anything that you're doing, you're, you're a buyer, you're talking to folks, and you want to get to the truth, is this your lowest price? And people are doing things to convince you that that's the lowest price. Let's start with that, okay? They are going to do things, they're going to say things to convince you that that's the lowest price. You're having a conversation with them. You're trying to determine, is it the lowest price? What else can I get? Um, just lots of questions that you have. You're taking notes. You're thinking of follow-up questions. It is like getting a drink of water out of a fire hose. There's too much going on. If I tell you 
Forget about looking for truthful behavior because you will see it on some questions. Forget about looking at truthful behavior, then that cuts your job half and half, right? Now you're getting a drink of water out of a garden hose as opposed to out of a fire hose, all right? It makes things a lot easier. But truthful people or pe deceptive people who give you truthful answers make it look like um, they're good folks. They're cooperative folks. They're going to give you everything that you need to get. All right? And in reality, what they're doing is convincing you that they're being truthful because you saw one good answer, not several good answers. Okay? For just a moment, let's go back to Jamie. What did Jamie do that made you think she was deceptive? What did she do? Somebody said, somebody said she was lying right out of the box. What did she do? Okay, she, can't, she touched her, her face, her feet were tapping. What else? She was blinking a lot. Too quick to answer all the questions. Okay, conversely, what did she do that you liked? Did all of you think she was guilty? Okay, what did she do that you liked? Okay. Okay, that's good. And were you the one that yelled out she's lying? Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no I, I, I knew it came from that direction, but, but, but that's good, right? So it was, one of these it was one of these situations where you were yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. That is every conversation that you will have with people. Sounds good, sounds bad, sounds good, sounds bad. How do we split between the two? Did I see a hand up over there? Yes. Yeah, I, I didn't decorate the room. I just did the interview. <laughs> so, but no, you're absolutely right. And, that, and that's the, when I talk about people manipulating our perception, manipulating us to believe them, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because there were some questions that she answered pretty, pretty nicely, right? There were some questions that she didn't. You know, what, we, what we do in a lot of situations is we ask people, um, for example, when we do an investigation inside the organization, um, you know, one of our questions will be, what do you do here? And most of the people will just give you a job, to a job title, all right? But the people that we know are, are already setting out to manage our perception will give us this long job description, okay? That goes way beyond what we're asking for. So they give us so much information. And the purpose of that is, again, to convince us that they're good people. Well, what happens when I hear, if, I, if I'm a novice and I hear a truthful answer, I start to think that's a good person. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay? I start to believe they're good. I start to believe that they want to they cooperate. And when I talk about the halo effect, that's what I'm talking about. So if I'm not looking for deceptive behavior and looking for truthful behavior instead, I'm going to find truthful behavior. And it's going to convince me early on that that person's good. And then I'm going to miss the bad. I like the fact that you guys brought up a couple of things that's going to be here later. I like the fact that you saw the feet moving. I like the fact you saw the, the nose thing, uh, scratching her nose. But which is right? Is she truthful or is she deceptive? What makes us right? All right? So we're going to talk that we're going to get more into that. All right. I want to recognize evasiveness. Have you ever asked someone a question and they've talked for 10 minutes and then you realize they never answered the question you asked? Okay, right? I mean, it, it happens all the time. If you, ask somebody, if you ask somebody, is that your best price, and they go through all these things, tell you all these reasons why that's their best price, but they haven't said no, okay? They've not given you the answer that you've asked for. If you're, if you're interviewing somebody for a job, and you ask them if they've ever had problems with a, 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 with a, a supervisor or problems in a job, and they give you all these great reasons for why they're a good employee, but they never answer whether or not they had any problems in a job. But we don't hear it, because we're not thinking. We're not listening for whether they answer the question or not. We're just listening for whether they answer. So we need to make sure that they're actually giving us the information we're asking for. The other thing is what we call failure to deny. The most important thing to the honest person is giving you that answer, denying if they didn't do something. That's the most important thing. The truth is their biggest ally. So they're going to want to deny something if they haven't done it. 
okay? They're going to want to deny anything that is going to make them look better if they haven't done it. So that's, we need to listen for people to deny stuff. Then we have what we call exclusionary qualifiers. Now, by exclusionary qualifiers, I mean things like um, saying, for the most part, fundamentally, uh, not really, not really. Exclusionary qualifiers beg for a follow-up question. All right, absolutely beg for a follow-up question. Now, poor Erin sat here right in front of me, so I'm going to be picking on her for the whole presentation. But let's say, okay, I've met Erin. Let's say I met Erin last night, and I really want to make a good impression with you guys. So I go to Erin this morning, and I say, hey, Erin, look. Do you think what I'm wearing is okay for today? Now, I realize, I realize the conflict here because I'm sitting in front of a whole bunch of retail people Okay, some of you who sell clothes. So I realize I'm putting myself right in the mix here, but let's say to Erin, Darren, do you see anything wrong with what I'm wearing? And her response is not really. Think about this for a moment. Not really. Okay, so, you know, if I'm in my, my optimistic mood, which doesn't happen very often, but I'm in an optimistic mood and I hear not really, I think, oh, I'm okay, right? What I'm wearing is okay. But if I don't hear it from an optimistic standpoint, I hear it from a negative one, I go, oh, not really. So my next question to Aaron is going to be, what? What's my next question to Aaron? OK, well, Aaron, if there's, if there's something you had to pick that you don't like about it, what would it be? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> I just want to see if you would. No. <laughs> but you hear what I'm saying? If somebody says not really, it's begging a follow-up. So my follow-up, it's got to come. Because if I don't ask that follow-up, I'm not going to get it. All right? I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to hear what the, the real answer is. So if somebody says to you, well, fundamentally, this is the way we do things, or for the most part, this is the, things that we, that w this is the way we do things, they're cutting something out. We want to know what it is that they're cutting out. So you have to ask that follow-up question. Well, okay, that's what you do basically, but what did you do in this situation? Okay? So that's exclusionary qualifiers. Aggression, attacking the questioner. Let's say you've had a theft, and you're interviewing all of your employees, all right? And, and you ask them, did you, did you have anything to do with this? Did you remove any of this information? Right? And they just come back at you and say, you guys always think it's me. You know, it's just because of the way I was born or how I dress or whatever. It, you always think it's me. And they question. They attack you. You know? how, you're not even in this store. You don't even know what goes on. People walk in and out all the time. That's big. All right? When I talk about different behaviors, there's some behaviors that weigh more than others. Aggression is one of those. Okay? If you have somebody who jumps down your throat because you ask them a question, I don't even care if it's your kid. You, know, you, you say to your kid, what did you do last night? And they're like, why are you always asking me this? You don't trust me. Why don't you trust me? Okay? What have I ever done? All right? You got a problem. <laughs> you got a problem. All right? Attacking a third party. All right? It's the same sort of thing. You know, look, it's the store's fault. The store doesn't have very good security. All right, it's, 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 you know, we, have, we don't have what we need in here. Um, you know, you're, you guys never bring the right stuff in. Of course, stuff's going to disappear because we can't sell it. All right, they're attacking the third party, right? Again, it's a big deal. Anytime you're talking about aggression, any sort of attack, it's big. Demonstrating an inappropriate level of concern. Opposite ends of the spectrum. You ask them a question, you ask them a, an important question, and they're like, oh, please. You know, oh, here we go again, those sort of things. Or they just get angry. They go from 0 to 120 for, for really no reason. You just ask a question. That's it. Let me give you a, sm a small example of that. And, you know, an aggression can be words. I mean, I mean concern can be words, or it can be, it can be what they do on their face. Any of you guys in here remember Scott Peterson? Right? He killed his, was convicted of killing his wife and unborn child. Lacey? Is that her name? Okay. Um, and eventually he was convicted. But before, when he was sitting in jail, there was an interview that they had with uh, Diane Sawyer. And you know, leading up to it, and Diane said, but Scott, here's the question. Everybody in America wants to know, did you kill your wife? Now, probably um, most of us would sit there and, if we hadn't killed our spouses, would try to figure out 
the right, or would know the right things to say. What Scott Peterson did and said was he smiled. First thing that he did was he smiled, and he goes, oh, I love my wife. No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't kill Lacey. Okay, but he smiled. How weird is that? You made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Somebody just asked you if you killed your wife, an unborn child, and you're smiling? Okay, so anyway, an inappropriate level of concern. Now, here's where I want to get into what you guys were talking about a minute ago, this, con this convince versus convey. If I ask, what's your name? Tiffany? Because I'm, I'm really tired of picking on poor Aaron. If I, if I ask Tiffany, Tiffany, did you take the merchandise? Okay. What are the two answers that Tiffany can give me that would let me know whether or not she took the merchandise? What are the two appropriate answers that would convey information? Yes or no? Yes or no? But what if I say, Tiffany, did you take the missing merchandise? And she runs into this whole, look, I'm a good employee. I've been loyal to this company for so long. Um, I've never done anything that would give you any reason to think I'm less than, than a seller employee. What is she doing here? Is, is she conveying information or is she trying to convince me of something? She's trying to convince me of something, right? She's trying to convince me she's a good employee that nobody should ever have any question about, okay? That is what you're going to hear most of the time. A convincing statement is the, the strongest arrow that any person's going to have in their quiver, okay? Saying, I'm a good person, I'm a good worker, all of those sort of things. When you talk about trying to, trying to manage someone's perception, I mean, think about it. Think about it for just a moment. Because maybe Tiffany is a good person. Maybe Tiffany is a stellar employee. Maybe she had a bad day, she took something, and now she doesn't know what to do. So when somebody's trying to convince me of something, going back to a minute ago when I said people can talk, they can, they can answer a question for 10 minutes, but never answer the question I asked. They can talk all day. When I said I've seen CEOs live for 25 minutes on a single question, that's what I'm talking about. They'll start talking about how healthy their company is, how great their sales are, how wonderful their employee and their management team are. What they're doing is trying to convince me, not convey information to me. Okay? Convincing statements are so strong. Let me give you another example from history. You guys all remember, um, oh, I can't remember her last name. Susan, um, the, the woman who put her children in the back of the car, or in the car, in their car seats, and Susan Smith, thank you. How can you forget Smith? Okay, um, Susan Smith, she put her kids in the car seat, um, you know, pushed the car into the lake, ran to the cops and said that somebody had carjacked her car, right? We were doing a training session for some, for some law enforcement in Indiana, and these gentlemen happened to be in the class. They're from Union, South Carolina. They happened to be in the class. And they came up and they said, um, Hayden, we now know how Susan Smith initially beat us when she came into the police station. And she ran into the station. She's crying. She's hysterical. Someone hijacked my car. My kids are in the car. Susan, did you have anything to do with it? Susan Smith's answer was, I love my children. I would never harm my children. Why would I hurt my children? What did you not hear? You didn't hear a denial, right? You didn't hear her say, no, I didn't. What you did hear her say was, I wouldn't hurt my children. Guess what? Wouldn't and didn't aren't the same thing. Somebody says, I wouldn't do something. It's not the same thing as saying, I didn't do something. We have to listen for didn't. Okay? We have to listen for the words, what people are saying, not what we think they say. Because in our thought, it doesn't make sense for someone to kill their kids, right? In fact, in fact, we said to them, we said, well, what did you say to her? And why did she beat you? And they said, because what she said made sense. Now, for just a moment, they hadn't done an investigation yet, right? She just came in. She's crying. She's hysterical. She's got all this stuff going on. They have no proof of anything other than the fact of what she's standing there telling them. And so they say, you know, we said to her, what did you say? What did you say? And we said, well, we asked her why she would say that. And, you know, we got this behavior. We didn't like this behavior. So we finally said to her, we said, Susan, look, sometimes things happen, and, you know, your parents, your parents get out of control. And for just a moment, you know, 
just a moment, maybe something happened. And she just continued with, no, I love my children. I would never hurt my children, blah, 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 blah. OK. So what we say is when you hear convincing statements and you're, you have no investigation in Susan Smith's case, what you have to do is go, hmm, I just heard three protest statements or convincing statements. I love my children. I would never harm my children. I would do nothing to hurt my children. I don't hear a denial. If we talk about clusters being two or more, do I have a lie? Absolutely, right? I've got the, I've got the not, uh, not answering or not giving me a denial, and I've got three what we call convincing statements. Okay. Now, convincing statements sound so true, or in this particular case, irrefutable. irrefutable. Let's say this, the officer say to Susan, so Susan, look, you say you didn't kill your wife, or kill your kids, prove it, prove it. And she goes, I love my kids, I take care of my kids, I take them to church, they're happy, they're well fed, they're well clothed, all this sort of stuff. Now, Mr. Police Officer, what do you have? At this point, they got nothing. So convincing statements sound really true. Again, Tiffany may be a good person, but that didn't answer my question, okay? So guess who I'm gonna be looking at? I'm gonna be looking at Tiffany. Okay? Uh, referral statements. Referral statements are statements that people make over and over again to try to convince you they didn't do anything wrong. All right? So let's say, let's say this young lady standing at the back right here. Let's say she went outside to go to the bathroom while I'm standing here talking. She comes back in and she goes, hey, Susan, let me interrupt for just a sec. Uh, I need you guys to know that there are um, some little green men running around the hallway. Now, what's our first impression of this young lady who just walked in? Right? Okay, but let's say she goes, no, I, I know, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm telling you, some, some little green men running around out there. Now, what are we inclined to do? Go look, right? So she's now starting to bring us in. We're starting to believe a little bit about what she says. That, again, is perception manipulation, all right? <laughs> Invoking religion. People will talk about, you know, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I swear to God. Um, in the accounting world, I swear on Gap. You know, all these sort of things that, that people... <laughs> All these sort of things that people will tell us, because let's face it, in this, especially in this world of political, um, you know, rightness and everybody wanting to be good and not step on anybody's toes, somebody throws out religion. What do you have in your backpack, your purse, your desk drawer that beats religion? Okay, that's a dangerous, dangerous one. Perception qualifiers are a little different than exclusionary qualifiers. Perception qualifiers are the things that people say and do to dress up their lie to verbally dress up their lie. Things like, well, to tell you the truth, honestly, frankly. Now, some of you all may be sitting in this room and saying, oh, cripe, these are, that's a common phrase for me. I'll say that stuff all the time, right? It's a habit, okay? You're lucky because we're looking at clusters, okay? So you get your frankly. You get your honestly. It's when you start having, start having more and more um, uh, deception in your, in your uh, answer that we're going to pay attention. Okay, nonverbals. Now, a lot of times people will say to me, well, Susan, if you say that the behaviors start within the first five seconds, I'll beat you and just not do or say anything for five seconds. Well, unfortunately for you, a behavioral pause is a deceptive indicator. Okay? Now, for just a moment, you have to think about this because you have to ask yourself if you get a pause, did the question make sense for a pause? So if I say to Aaron, for example, Aaron, um, let's see, uh, J uh, January 26th, 10 years ago, what were you doing? Does that allow a pause? Right? OK, so it's only fair that she gets a pause there. But what if I say, so Aaron, um, January 26, 10 years ago, did you rob the Bank of America? Yeah, see, she answered that pretty quickly, right? If it had taken her time to think about that answer, you guys got to look at your hiring policies, OK? Because that would have been a problem, all right? Verbal, nonverbal disconnect. What I want you to do, I want you to do a little trick for me, for, or another little game for me for a moment. I want you to look at the person sitting next to you. Before you do it, though, look at me. I want you to look at the person sitting next to you, and I want you to say, do you like me? Okay. And I want that person to go, yes, I like you very much. Okay. And then I want you to switch. So do it real quick, because we don't have much time. Okay. Okay, all right, Woo. Okay, all right, I don't have a lot of time. Okay, did that feel weird? Did that feel weird? All right, and that's telling you to do that, okay? That's telling you to do that, and you find it hard to do. All right, you're deliberately doing it. If you see someone do that, it's huge. 
It means their brain is so fried that they're not doing what their body is made to do. Okay? Now, everything that I'm talking about, um, with, exam with exception to that one verbal, nonverbal disconnect, is cross-cultural, cross-gender. You can use it anywhere in the world. This one is one of those you cannot. All right? You can't, because they're, India, for example, they, that's how they answer. All right? But every place else, um, you can use the verbal, nonverbal disconnect. You just have to know your audience a little bit. Anchor point movements. Anchor point movements are the things that anchor you to the ground, to the world, to the earth. For example, my feet right now would be anchor points. If my arms are like this, they would be anchor points. If you ask me a question and in response to that question, I move my arms or my legs, that's an anchor point movement. All right? Um, you mentioned the feet. If I'm sitting in a chair, my, my bottom is my anchor point, my back's my anchor point, my feet are my anchor point, feet are always anchor points, all right? Um, we all, women especially, have a tendency to sit with our legs crossed, and we have that foot that's dangling, we call a, um, a hanging uh, anchor point. Watch it, because that's where it's going to go. That person's trying to maintain control of themselves is going to go to that floating anchor point. Grooming gestures, things that people do to, again, uh, dress up the lie. They might fix their tie. They might fix their hair. They might look at their watch. Anything like that that would be uh, dressing up the lie physically. And then finally, hands to the face. Okay. If some if someone is in a flight or fight syndrome or flight or fight phase, uh, which means that they, rather than tell you the truth, they're going to try to keep it in. They're going to do stuff. The the um, blood vessels at the ends of the fingers and, and the ends start to shrink and it itches. So they will um, start playing with their, their nose or their ear or, sh or scratch their hands or things like that. So hands to the face are huge. OK, any questions? You want another shot at her? Oh, yes, sir. There seemed to be an art or a science around the pauses that you had mm -hmm. after every question. Can you talk a little bit about uh, yes, that? Yes, I can. It means I'm going to cut in my answer. Can, can you ask me an answer and question session so I do what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> okay. All right. Let's. Uh, but but you're absolutely right. Um, let's look at her real quick. Think about things that we talked about. Think about what you guys mentioned earlier um, about you would like the fact that she was answering those questions more, but that's not good. Okay. And she didn't really answer the question. So the more people talk, the worse it is. Okay. So let's go. My first question for you, Jamie, is what involvement did you have in the company's recently discovered fraudulent accounting activities? Oh, none at all. Appropriate level of concern, feet move. Did you ever direct Mr. Glenn to backdate any contracts? No, oh, of course not. <laughs> feet move, inappropriate level of con uh, concern. Prior to the recent audit that uncovered these accounting irregularities, did you have any knowledge that Mr. Glenn was backdating contracts? No. I mean, if I, if I had knowledge about that, then I would speak up and say something. Convincing statement. I would have spoke up. Feet move. Is there any reason that a forensic computer review would uncover any communication with Mr. Glenn regarding this matter? No. Of course, then. I don't have any communication with him regarding this at all. I'm okay with that one, except for the feet move, but that's only one behavior. At any time, did Mr. Glenn ever reveal or discuss his efforts to manipulate the company's accountings with you? No. If he had, then I would have told someone, fired him, gotten something. Something would have happened if I knew anything. So I had some, again, some convincing statements. The feet, love the feet. Jamie, why should we believe that you're not involved in this matter? I've always had a very good reputation with the company. Um, I have no uh, enemies in the company. No one, you know, I, I've always done my best. And I believe that I have a very good reputation with that. And people trust me. And um, I, I would never do something like that, especially for something that I've worked so hard at. OK, I'm going to end that. Because I think we all see the convincing statements, we see the feet and things like that. Um, I'm not going to just go through the rest of the questions. How do we feel about her now? She's a liar. Yeah. Well, just so you know, at the end of the, uh, my role, my role in this investigation was um, not only to find the person who was being deceptive, but to confront the person who I thought was being deceptive. Just so you know, she she showed over 26 deceptive behaviors in that short interview. Okay. For me, it was a neon sign. I knew immediately it was her. OK? 
Okay. So anyway, um, those, are, those are the keys to success, the ones that we talked about. Um, Shireen's going to come up here. I know we've got a couple questions. Um, so sh can I answer his question? Okay. Absolutely. So, <laughs> after they're done. So yes, I put pauses between my questions and the answer. The reason for that is because um, you make it just south of being uncomfortable. People have a tendency to want to fill in quiet spaces. And a lot of times they'll do those, they'll, they'll fill it in with convincing statements or other things that will be deceptive. If I don't see anything else, then I'll ask the question, but I always try to wait at least three or four seconds before I ask my second question. Because if, if I'm machine gunning at them and asking questions, it makes them very comfortable to just answer real quickly. Okay. I have a really quick question for you because we're almost out of time, but how, how, does, it, how does all this work on the phone? Um, good question. It does work on the phone. Obviously, you lose the verbal. I mean, the nonverbal, so you don't see the person moving or anything like that. Um, but you can hear the chair squeak when they move back and forth in the chair. Uh, what you'll be paying more attention to is the verbal, obviously, listening for whether they're doing any of the things that we, that we talked about here. Um, and be careful, very careful when you're on the phone interviews about mind drift. Don't be thinking about what your next question is. Be thinking about what they're saying in their answer. OK? Yes. Um, that's th that's a good question. The behavior, if you're doing the verbal, how do you account for nervousness? Okay, if you're if you're look following the timing and clusters thing, again, nervous behavior is nervous behavior, but you're looking for the timing and those deceptive behaviors. And once you see those, you'll start to see the nerve. You don't care whether they're nervous, okay? Because people do stuff, and you don't know how people manifest nervousness versus deception. So you really have to follow the behaviors the timing and, and clusters and the behaviors, um, because you know everybody wants you to get it right. So we, we do, um, and, and I gave you the short and dirty of, of all this stuff. There's actually a book out we wrote called Spy the Lie, which has a lot more detail in it and can help you as much as you want. Um, a little plug, we also do training all around the country. If you guys think your company might want a training at one of your your uh, off sites or something like that, we, we come in and give you a longer presentation. Awesome. Our normal presentation is like three and a half hours. <laughs> Great. Susan, this okay. is fantastic Great. as always. All Thank right. you so much. Thanks, guys. Hi.